Aren't you glad? Isn't it good to know you're saved, got a place forever in heaven? Amen. Well, we're talking about the Galatians who had been duped to think that it wasn't as simple as that. So we're going to look at that tonight in Galatians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to look at some people try to influence you once you're saved to doubt your salvation. There's plenty of Pharisees alive and well today. Amen. There's plenty of Sadducees alive and well today to try to cause you to doubt the veracity of the Word of God. They want you to doubt the resurrection. They want you to doubt that Adam and Eve were real individuals in the garden and that the earth was created in seven days. They want you to doubt that God did everything and uh, that he said he did. And he doesn't even have to apologize. He just says, in the beginning, God. God never spends time trying to convince or prove it. He just says it. He did it. Amen? Amen. And it's our job just to believe it. Amen. God doesn't spend a lot of time trying to explain how he did that. He just said, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Amen. And uh, man doesn't believe it. Men uh, like Origen, who corrected the word of God, in 250 AD was a Gnostic, and he was an allegorist. All these new versions come for, through his hands. And that's why they so doubt on the person of Christ. They attack the deity of Christ, all the new versions out there. And we'll harp on it till Jesus comes. Amen? Because that's the battle. The devil wants to cause you to doubt God's word and believe some Pharisee. Believe some high muckety muck who thinks he's smarter than God's word. And you don't need that. What you need to do is get a Bible and hold fast to it and grow and, and get the engrafted word in your life. Amen. Amen? amen. Can I get an amen to that? That's what you need is your, to believe the Bible. I mean, I wrote a church today, a letter. Well, they have a site. and I, I'm probably going to copy paste everyone. And I, I looked up Calvary Chapel. Calvary, where they had Easter services, right? And I wrote them a little note, you know, said... I see you don't use the King James Bible, but you call your church Calvary, and you're celebrating Easter. And there's no Calvary in any other Bible, and there's no Easter in any other Bible, but a King James authorized version. Brother Bob. Well, they're just, that, see, that's just, they're using the King James, and then they make changes to it. So I don't even count that. That's not even a translation. They're just plagiarists. I don't care. I never look at the new King, new King James. Like we took the King James and we just made a few changes. Do they? All right. Well, I'm not. I never. When I talk about the new versions, I don't even. The new King James is just as bad as the rest of them because it tries to play walk the fence. But it's using the King James and making slight changes here and there from the same manuscripts, the Alexandrian. Every change in the New King James Bible is from the same corrupt source. So here we are in Galatians 4, and Paul harped to these people. He started out saying, you, you know, believed another gospel, which is not another. And he's going to tell us in chapter 4 about these people again as we go along. And what they're trying to do is in verse 10, get them back under uh, regulations, rules, um, Man's rules, man's righteousness, um, any kind of law besides you're free in Christ. Try to put a man under the law again once you're under grace. And that's what he says here in verse 10. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time to spend, uh, Lord, to study your word tonight. And God, we thank you that you saved us by grace and you keep us by grace. And that, Lord, uh, there are many uh, false brethren crept in unawares that rest the scriptures to their destruction, that don't believe in salvation by grace. They believe you've got to keep it after you've been saved, and you've got to walk it, and you've got to uh, live it, otherwise you can lose it. And we thank you, Lord, that once we're in Christ, we'll never lose it. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for the word of God that never changes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So he says uh, one of the things they start doing is turning to man's rules, man's laws, uh, back to the Old Testament even, Verse 10, ye observe days and months and times and years. So uh, they try to elevate one day or one week over another week. I don't make a big deal out of Easter. You may have noticed that. <laughs> to me, I think that's uh, just a kind of a marketed Christianity. 
Sorry to tell you. I, I, I don't mind if you want to. A Christmas, but Paul's kind of saying here, there's no difference. For the Christian, you get up every day, you pray, you read your Bible, and wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to be a light and a witness in this world. But for many Christians, it's a two-time of the year Christianity, where they observe days, times, months, and years. December is the time when Christ, you know, and they get all religious, uh, and then or Easter. And uh, the Bible says that one day to one man is, uh, you know, the, the Christian who's strong in faith, he uh, doesn't esteem one day over another day. Uh, the Christian that's weak, that's in, look in Romans 14. Paul's telling you that if you want to be strong in faith, you don't need Easter as some kind of Christmas or Christmas day where you have some holy day or the Annunciation or the Ascension. And before you know it, you have like the Baptists in Ukraine, they celebrate something like 12 days of the year where it's big holy days in the church. And everybody shows up for church only on those days. And uh, Paul's talking about it here. Verse 1, him that is weak in the faith. What does he do? Okay, receive them. They're, I mean, they're welcome. But you're going to have lots of weak Christians come and go in our church. You don't want to be a weak Christian. What is a weak Christian? He describes it. For one, believe it that he may eat all things. That's a strong Christian. Another who is weak eateth herbs. He has a diet that says, oh, I don't eat, you know, he'll come into church and he'll start trying to tell everybody, uh, that's not good to eat and this is kosher and that's not kosher. I've seen so many Christians come along. I mean, I had one with, I ate dinner with him and I started eating some cherries and he goes, oh, brother, you shouldn't eat those cherries. I said, why not? He said, they'll ferment in your stomach with the meat you just ate and you'll get drunk and I don't think God wants you to get drunk. And I said, Dina, pass the cherries. Amen. <laughs> I don't care. That's your conviction, man. You keep it. I don't need it. He, I had one guy telling the whole church, he, I don't want to mention his name. He was telling everybody you need to go and do enemas and you can't eat white flour and white sugar and uh, white rice. You know, I'm sorry, I'm white. You know, I mean, that's stuff I eat. <laughs> I mean, they're telling you what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat. I mean, that's for you, man. Amen. Praise the Lord. But I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying you're weak because you have a special diet for you. But when you make it like a religious thing and you tell everybody you want to do right, you know, with your body. I mean, Lester Roloff got night, mighty night of that. You know, he was taking a blender everywhere he went. And uh, he'd blend his food, you know. I mean, thank God for Lester Roloff. But I'm not going to live like Lester Roloff. I got my own convictions. Amen. I'm, doing, I'm not going to be brought under the power of any. And so I'm not going to tell that weak brother, you know, don't do that. And, you know, that's not, but you don't have to. You can eat all things, Paul said, if it's, it's sanctified by what? Prayer. The word of God and prayer. Those two ingredients. And I pray over everything. I try to pray if I even need a donut. Amen. Amen. And then that donut's better than any jumbo juice or any kind of juice there you can do because I prayed over it. But if you don't pray over that juice and all that ginger and all that, that gar whatever you eat that's good, and you forget to pray, then uh, you're, in, you're in danger. Amen. You ought to pray over it. That's what I do. You say, well, that's haphazard, brother. Hey, it works for me. Look how fit I am. Amen. <laughs> uh, amen. But I'm not, I'm just talking about what the Bible says, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. So, I mean, I eat, I'll eat that, they have this blood sausage in Ukraine. What they do is they take all the blood from the pig and they save it and then they, somehow they cook that stuff and put it and make sausages out of it. I'll eat that stuff. But the Baptists over there say, that's, that's sin, you can't eat that stuff. Well, I just don't eat it in front of them because I don't want to cause them to stumble, amen? I play Uno at, over there, and I had Christians tell me, that's of the devil, you're playing cards. And, and I, I just say, well, okay, I'll put them away. And then I'll play Uno when I'm not around that poor, sappy Christian, amen? Because that's your conviction, and you're trying to put me under the power of your conviction, and I'm just not going to be a stumbling block. I don't really believe I'm a stumbling block. I just think they want to pontificate. That's my thought. A lot of them just want to put you under their power. But I'll be gracious and say, okay, I won't do it. I mean, amen, I'll try to be a gracious Christian. There's a lot of things that people are going to try to put you under their convictions. And Paul says, don't worry about it, but don't do it, don't despise them. Uh, him that eateth not, I like to eat everything. I'll eat shrimp, I'll eat lobster, I'll eat snails. Amen, I don't like them. And, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. So that's what they do. A lot of them will say, you shouldn't eat that. You know, God 
told you in the Old Testament, don't eat pork, and that's bad for you. That's why, I don't believe that's why God said don't eat pork. I don't think it's because of the trichinosis, sorry. I think it's just because pigs are dirty, and it was a bad illustration for the Jews. He said, I want you to be a clean people, not like that dog or that pig. And so he said, that's my conviction. If you have another one, that's fine. I just think pigs are dirty, and God says, I don't want you to associate with them. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Now look at the verse 5. One man, just like back in verse 2, one man esteemeth one day above another. He said before that was the weak one who thinks certain things are holy and certain things are not. And another esteemeth every day alike. He's the brother that's strong. Just like the guy who could eat all things that it's sanctified by prayer. Every day is alike to the true believer when it's sanctified with prayer. When you get up and pray and you say, Lord, lead me this day, that's a more holy day than the Easter Sunday morning. You know, when people get up and don't pray and they don't read their Bible all year and they go to church. Okay, I'm not just getting on people to come to church on Easter, amen, we can lead somebody to Christ on that day or Christmas katana and sing and somebody will get saved. But we ought to see somebody try to get somebody saved every week, every day. Amen. Not, it's fine to have a big production when people labor and try to put on a show to get a hook and try to get some of those people that are more formal and they show on, only darken the doorstep of a church once a year when some, you know, there's a Christmas choir going on. That's praise the Lord. If one gets saved, praise the Lord. But I think we did something like that. Where was that? Where I preached. It was, yeah, we had it here. And I don't think anyone got saved, you know, amen? But if they did, praise the Lord. But I gave a, a, a passionate invitation, and there was a lot of work put in. But you might, the Lord might move, he may not. I don't, but I'm saying it doesn't, one day is just like another day. Sometimes we think that's a special day, Christmas Day. And it's not. It's like every other day. The whole world lieth in, what's the Bible say? The whole world lieth in darkness. So, I mean, this world is under the God of this world. So there's no day that's so holy anymore. <laughs> Christ is coming back. He's going to change that. But ye observe days and months and times and years. We're no longer under the years of Jubilee or the year of uh, seven years. Every, you know, you're supposed to let none of that. That's the law, Paul said. And some of them are trying to keep the law here. Verse 12, brethren, I beseech you, be as I am. Paul says, I'm no longer under the law, for I am ye, as ye are. You know what he did? He said, as when I'm with the Gentiles, I make myself a Gentile. He said, don't you see that? I, I, I don't even press or preach circumcision. Neither should you. He said, I, I, no longer, I preach Christ crucified. I preach the gospel. I'm not preaching days and months and years as a Jew. I've let, I count it but dung. I count my Judaism but dung that I may win Christ. So Paul says, I am as ye are. I will eat anything now. I don't observe days. I'm like, I become like a Gentile under Christ. I put away my Judaism. And then he says, ye have not injured me at all. He says, the only ones you're hurting is yourself and you're hurting Christ. It's no skin off my back. That's what Paul's saying. I love you. I've labored for you. But you know what? If you're not going to run and live for Christ, and I've run in vain, I feel sad about it. But when I stand before the judge seat of Christ, my conscience will be clear. But you'll have to answer for going back under the law, back under this circumcision, back under these man-made rules, and you've injured yourself. That's what he said here. He said, ye have not injured me at all. I haven't changed. My gospel hasn't changed. My word, I'm still preaching the truth. And... Um, Go on to verse 13. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. Paul says, I, I labored, I really suffered to get you the gospel. And if that's not appreciated, then you're just going to lose all the things that others have labored on you and uh, in vain. And he's worried about that. It's what he says in, uh, where does he say, you know, I'm, I'm afraid that I've labored in vain. Yeah, I'm afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. It's like a parent sending their child off for four years of college and paying for all those years, and then that child gets messed up on drugs or alcohol the last year and starts partying and never graduates. <laughs> and, uh, man, that's a lot of money, $100,000 out the window. You know, the kid just wasted his life. He goes out and becomes a bum. And Paul's like thinking of that. He's like, 
I'd hate to have labored all those years and preached the gospel here to let somebody else come along and just ru and ruin your life and wreck your life. And he's saying that in verse 11. He said, I am afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Uh, I really don't want to run in vain or labor in vain. I really want to see the fruit of my labor. You parents, when you invest in your child's life, you want to see, you know, something come out of their life. Like Colin, he was like, Dad, I think I want to just get a GED. They call it something else now. And then not, not go back to school. I said, no, you worked 11 years, and now you're just going to go get the old. You know, you finish school. You finish what you started. Uh, you finish that 12th year. You, that's putting in 11 years of school and then not finish the 12th year. Finish what you start. Paul wanted to see them finish the race. He said, ye did run well earlier. Who hath hindered you? that ye should not obey the truth. Christians need to finish the race. Amen? You've started for Christ. You've grown in the Lord. Now press on and get, go on to higher ground. The devil's always going to try to get you to turn back, just like the children of Israel, go back to Egypt. And Paul says, I really would not want to see you and all the labor and all my, the temptation which was in my flesh. That was a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet him it was his eyes. He said, I was, I was stoned to death to bring you the gospel. And Iconium and Lystra, they dragged me out of town and they stoned me to death. And it was at that time I was caught up into, into the third heaven and saw unspeakable things. And it was there when I was bringing you the gospel, they stoned me to death. That's why he starts out uh, about 14 years before in chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem. So he had brought them the gospel early on. And then uh, 14 years later, along comes a bunch of Pharisees saying, except you be circumcised, you cannot be saved. So Paul's saying, you know, you know how bad my eyes were when I came here. My temptation was to quit. I, I mean, I couldn't hardly see. I, could, I had to have people lead me about. I had to have a doctor with me. And the flesh, my flesh, I, I, three times I prayed, Lord, take this from me. And then the, finally the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. And I surrendered to that and said, all right, Lord, I would rather, therefore, rather glory in mine infirmities. And he said, I pressed on for your sakes. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, he despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God. That's how they first received Paul, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness she spake of? For I bear you record that if, I had been, if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. That's why I believe it was his eyes that he had lost his eyesight. They loved him when he first came and preached the gospel. But now they turned their hearts against Paul. Now they were listening to this other group who had ill affected their minds. And had taught them that you can lose your salvation. We're in the next verses. It's a great verse, verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? That's going to happen to you, Christian. If you will tell people the truth, they're going to hate you. <laughs> They hated the Lord Jesus Christ. They hated Joseph when he told him his dream. He was just being sincere. He just said, I had a dream. Guess what? It was the wildest dream. And he told his brothers the dream. And they envied him. They envied Jesus Christ. They hated Jeremiah. Put him in jail. Threw him in a pit. They hated Micaiah. Told the truth. Even the king had to say, how many times have I adjured thee to tell me, you know, the truth? And they hated Micaiah. Threw him in the jail. All through the Bible, they hated the man who was going to tell the truth. And if you're going to tell the truth, if you're going to tell people the truth, it's going to, it's going to be dangerous. <laughs> They're going to, you're going to lose some friends. People don't, they want to have their ears tickled, and that's what these Pharisees were doing. That's what they're doing. They're marketing Christianity with beautiful posters, beautiful websites, beautiful uh, churches with all the floral and all the, and Christianity has gone to where people have to be softly whispered to to be able to bring them into church. And when you just preach the old fashioned Bible and tell a man like Paul did, then they, they don't like it. They like these Pharisees. Look at the next verses. They zealously affect you, but not well. I mean, they're out there to get your money. They're out there, they're, they'll do whatever they have to. They'll bend over backward to make one proselyte. That's what Jesus said about the Pharisees. To make them a twofold child of hell because of the love of money. More people they get in their churches, more the charismatics can dupe people and uh, whisper in their ears sweet nothings. I mean, they really do, man. They pump them up. Always telling them positive, positive, positive. 
Never tell the truth, never say a negative thing. Never mention sin, never mention judgment, never mention hell, never mention uh, wrath of God. Never mention Armageddon, tribulation, uh, the, the things that are to come upon this world, the days of God's wrath. They don't want to hear that. And they don't want to hear that there's one Bible. They don't want to hear this Bible's perfect and you've got to get right with God and get in the Bible and live for the Lord. Nobody, that, that's, they hated Paul for that even. He said, am I therefore become your enemy? Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Another place he said something to affect, look in, uh, what is it, 2 Corinthians 12, 15. 2 Corinthians 12, 15. The more you grow in the Lord, the more you speak the truth and start living like a living Bible. I mean, you can be gracious, amen. I'm not saying you have to make enemies with everybody. But what I'm saying is if you're going to tell people the truth of the Word of God, you're going to make quite a few enemies. And Paul says here, I will, there, I, will, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. You might want to just meditate on that for a little while. The more, you, uh, the more I love you, the less I am loved. What he's saying is the more you live like Jesus Christ, more chances they're going to try to crucify you by the time you get out of this world. Brother Tristan. 2 Corinthians 12, 15. The more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. And so uh, our Savior, who could be more lovely than Jesus? Amen? Who could be sweeter than the Savior? I mean, think about it. I mean, how wonderful Jesus Christ was. And what did they do with him? They tried to take him and throw him off a cliff. You know, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with but it said that he was, there was, there was no, he was like a root out of dry ground. There was no comeliness in him. He was like anybody else because it says he went through their midst. If he looked like a shining light and blue eyes and blonde hair, everybody would say, get him, that's him. You know? They didn't know who Jesus was. He looked like just the average Joe. He didn't look anything special. He looked just like, he was a, just like anyone else. He was a Jew from Palestine. And so uh, they tried to throw him off a cliff in Nazareth, his own hometown. And so many times they, the Pharisees counseled together how they might put him to death. And finally they did. And so Paul's saying here that I love you Galatians. And sometimes it seems like your children will hate you whenever you try your best to try to be a good parent. It's just, uh, it just seems uh, you, you do your best. I've seen a lot of Christians do their best and their kids just seem to go to the devil sometimes. Uh, I just It breaks your heart. I've seen some kids go to homosexuality. I've seen some kids go to drugs. And I'm talking preachers and, and missionaries and some of the best Christians I know. And you say, well, it wouldn't happen to me. Don't beware. It can happen to anybody. And you love your kids with all your heart and you give your life for them and then they might just be like that prodigal son. He went off and that father would look every day for him and prayed for him. And finally he did come home, thank God. Amen. And then, but those kids, some, I've, I've watched these Ukrainian kids. It's almost nine times out of ten when somebody adopts them and brings them, like if they're already 12 or older, the success rate is like one in a hundred. Those kids end up despising those people who brought them out of poverty, brought them out of a squalor, brought them out of chance of becoming a prostitute or a drug addict is very high. And then those kids despise those parents who delivered them from a life of des destruction. I've seen it happen so many times. I talked to a girl today who hates her mother here in Kalispell, and she's from Odessa, a Russian girl. Speaks Russian, I mean, a Ukrainian girl. I spoke to a woman whose son is also 19 or 20, no, 21, and he hates her and won't talk to her. And both of these parents adopted these kids out of a terrible life. The girl was pregnant at 15 years old, and she brought her and adopted her and helped her, and she, I mean, and they both hate their parents. And a lot of times it's that language barrier. And you know what you do? You hate the Lord sometimes because you don't understand him. And you don't like the, way the, the ways of the Lord. The more he loves, the, more he's, the less he is loved. And if you live like Jesus Christ, you'll find that too. The more you live as a Christian, the world will hate you. Marvel not if the world hate you. And so Paul faced that. When people come along who don't truly love your children or love like this illustration I gave and they'll destroy them because they really don't care about them but they act like they're their best friend and that's what Paul's saying about these Pharisees 
He says, they zealously affect you, but not well. They're not looking for your best interest. They, they're hurting you. They're whispering uh, lies to you, and you're falling for it. And then you leave church, and you leave the fellowship. You leave the King James Bible crowd. You leave the, the doctrine of I'm saved, once saved, always saved, eternal security. And you end up with some real, they wash out. I've, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. They go, oh, we're, we're looking for another church. Uh, this happened many times over my ministry over the years. I've seen people come and go. And they, they don't get in the church. And they end up just pff, divorce or a bunch of bad things can happen. Don't quit fighting Christians. Stay in church. Realize that there's people out there whispering in your ear and say, do you know what's wrong with your church? you know what's wrong with Paul? you know what's wrong with your doctrine? Get in your Bible and say, you know what? Shut up. Don't talk bad about my pastor. Don't talk bad about the Bible. I don't want to hear it. I'm not giving ear to the devil. Amen. Christians need to stand up and stop listening to the little whisperings of the Pharisees out there and say, hey, I think you're, that's sin. You shouldn't be gossiping about a man of God without two or three witnesses. Amen. Shut them up. They didn't do that with Paul. They believed these guys. And Paul was heartbroken over it. And he says to them, yea, they would exclude you. They'd even cut you out of eternity in heaven. They don't even care if you make it to heaven. They don't even care if you're circumcised. They don't really care. They only want to make merchandise of you. They'd cut you out. <laughs> if it was push came to shove, they didn't give up anything for you. I did. I, I had my eyes. I was beaten to death to bring you the gospel. And these people would exclude you that you might affect them, that they might fill their pockets. That's the only thing they're interested in. They, you are, um, you're just goods to us. In churches, and ministries today just use people and chew them up and spit them out because they're just goods to them. They might affect them, enrich them. And then he says this, but it is, it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. Not in a, uh, like he said there, but not well in verse 17. Bad. Uh, the things they do are just bad for you. But here he's saying, hey, good, be zealously affected, but always in a good thing. Good, zeal is good, but make sure your zeal isn't misdirected. And not only when I am present with you. Um, so don't just put on a show. Just be that way. Be real. Amen. Pastor's here, pastor's not. Preacher's here. Paul said, don't worry about whether I'm here. Be right with God and be zealous about the truth. Now verse 19, and we'll kind of finish up in 19 and 20. Um, we're going to see here where the doctrine of... Um, Standing in state. And we'll go into some other verses to explain it just again. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So you're born again, but Paul says, I yearn for you that you might that Christ would be formed in you. Well, what does that mean? Well, when when the gestation takes place or the incubation takes place, you're born. I believe that the egg, whenever the, the soul's already put in that egg, whenever that miracle takes place with the spermazoa and God does something, the Bible says that's a life already. I believe the soul's in the womb. And so uh, what he's saying here, though, that you're, you're born again, you have Christ in you, but a lot of people just never let Christ be formed in them. They got saved, and you can't even tell they're saved. And that was what he's saying about the Galatians. I don't even know if you're saved. Look at verse 20. He said, I, I, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. How many people do you say, were, did they go to heaven? Well, they did pray when they were little, but boy, I never saw any fruit in their life. How many of you ever heard that? He said, I really hope that, that I hope they really made it to heaven. All I can say is that they, one time in vacation Bible school, you know, every one of us knows somebody like that. Amen. I, I'm dealing with a woman now who uh, her grandson killed himself and she was in tears just agonizing over whether or not he ever really truly got saved. And she said she did pray with him. And Aunt Pei says, I remember when you called and said they got saved. And that was a comfort to her. That's the most important thing, that his soul was saved. Amen. Amen. And, and she had it written in her Bible. And Dina, we were praying and she found it written in her Bible, right? And it had a date. She said, right there. And uh, had his name, had a date when he prayed and got saved. And so, but other than that, there was never any fruit that you could see. He would, why? Christ was never formed in him. And that means you, you got to 
Christ is the seed. Look in 1 John 3. So Paul says here that Christ, uh, he said, I travail like a mother until Christ be formed in you. So there's a picture of a woman with a baby in her womb in a way. You know, you have something in you that's forming. That's kind of the way Paul's putting it. Christ is in you, but you, got, you want to let the full stature of Christ grow up in you. You want Christ, the new man, the inner man, to grow. That's why Paul calls it the, the inner man, the new man. Amen? The Bible says the hidden man of the heart in another place, the women, the hidden man of the heart. So that means you have a man inside of you, Christ. And you need to say, Lord, I want Christ to grow in me, and I want to know that full Christian walk. Not just be saved and be a baby all my life, but grow up and be strong in the Word. That's what Paul's talking about. There seems to be a lot of baby Christians that you just, they know they're saved, but that's all they know. They never got the full stature of Christ in them, Ephesians 4. So here in uh, 1 John, I want to uh, mention stature, standing, and state. Now in 1 John chapter 3, you have being born again, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So it's like having the seed in you, but you want the seed to grow. Amen? Except the corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, to abide alone. But the seed can break, and it's now life is beginning to grow. But you want that seed to grow to full maturity. And then you get the wheat, the full head, and you can gr glean it, and you can utilize it, and there's fruit. And what we're saying is you've got to get the engrafted word in your life, and you've got to surrender to that book, and you've got to meditate on that book. And if you don't do that, you're just going to be, a, the seed is in you, but it never matured. You never watered it. You never prayed and sought and begged God and yearned and wept at night and said, God, I want to know you. I want to know your will. If you don't ever pray and yearn and say, Christ, be formed in me. You can always remain like a you know, playpen Christian. They never grow. And so here I want to say uh, standing. What is it? You don't sin, right? Christ is in you. And so Christ uh, is in you. You're saved. But there's this other part. That's state. Did Christ get formed in you? Yeah, you're saved. Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's your, that's your standing. I mean, that's your standing. Christ is in me. But this is what Paul's saying, oh, Christ be born. Uh, he says again. How did he say that? Oh, I forgot how he put it. But in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, it's an interesting thought. For, uh, let me get there. He says... My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Until Christ be formed in you. You could doctrinally take that you know, really out of context and say you don't have Christ in you yet. He's not formed in you yet. You're not there yet. You haven't gotten to salvation yet. No, that's not what Paul's talking about. Again, he said, you have Christ in you. That's your standing. But here's your state. Is Christ grown in you? Have you grown up and matured, and do you have fruit? So the verse here says one thing, you cannot sin. Now look back in chapter 1, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, I thought we just read it, it says that it cannot sin. The Bible contradicts itself. We just read that if, if any man be, as, if any, what does it say? Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. How many of you cannot sin? Raise your hand. Believe that Bible. Okay. Didn't you just read it? said you cannot sin because you're born of God? Okay. Now, catch you in the trap. You know what I'm leading to. If we say, verse 8, that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So which one's right? I mean, over here we read that you cannot sin, and over here we said if anyone says they do not 
commit sin, they lie and do not the truth. Well, because one is your standing and one is your state. One is your soul and where Christ dwells. The other one is how Christ takes control of your flesh and your body. You want Christ to be seen in your body. How you live every day. People look at your flesh. They don't look at your soul. They look at your works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. They can't look in your eyes and say, I see you have a good soul. No, they need to see your works. They need to see the gospel preached to them. They need to see you live it. And that's where you, your flesh, you've got to keep confessing your sins. Because that's your standing. How's it changed from day to day? There's a lot of hypocritical Christians out there, and a lot of people going to hell because of them. Amen. Amen. A lot of them have ruined their testimony, and people say, well, I won't become a Christian because of that person. Amen. Because the Christ is not formed in them. They never surrendered, never got baptized, or never went to church, never read the Bible, never prayed, say, I'm a Christian, and they go to the bar and live like the devil. They go out to the casinos, they go out to the world, and uh, they say, I'm a Christian. And Paul, and Paul says, you've got to confess your John says, you've got to confess your sins. It's like, you're an American, right? Let's just say it like this. You're, no matter what state you're in, you're an American. It's like, I'm a Christian, no matter what state I'm in. But if I'm, what state am I in? That's, there's different states you can be in. You could be right with God today. You might get backslidden. You might really be in grievous sin and God might have to judge you. There's different states. You could be living in the state of Texas, state of Montana, state of California, state of Massachusetts. You could be in a liberal state or a conservative state, a godly state like ours, amen? <laughs> or you could be in a backslidden state. States change, that's your flesh. That's your walk, your fellowship. Now let's finish up here in Philippians tonight and we'll pray. I want to show you how Paul puts it. We just saw there that one place it says you don't sin and another place it says if you say you don't sin then you lie. Well you, there's two parts to the, hum, the, 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 the makeup is your spiritual life and your physical life. Philippians chapter 3. I was in the Pentecostal church. They all speak Ukrainian. I want to introduce some, get some contacts with the saints that we brought up with us, Liana and Chengis and so forth. And um, the guy was preaching and he said one thing about, you know, because they don't believe you can have eternal security there. They're Pentecostals. And he was preaching out of Philippians 3 and he said he's trying to attain it, right? And he's misquoting it. You got to understand this standing in state because we're going to see something here real fast because of the time. There's going to be three words. You might want to underline them. Attain, apprehend, and be perfect or uh, perfect and Paul's going to use these three words in here several times and the verse uh, you want to look at here is verse 12 uh, or actually he used verse 11 if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead as though he may not make it he's trying to he was preaching that you have to live right that you might be part of that number you might attain unto it you follow y'all with me you can make that look that way, right? You might not make the resurrection. Paul was trying to attain it. And they was preaching that. That's a lie. I'll show you what he's trying to say here. Paul says, verse 10, that I may know him. Didn't Paul know Jesus? Yes, he did. That's his standing. That's your standing. You've been born again. You know the Lord. But do you really know the Lord in fellowship? And so Paul was saying, I want to attain to something more than I know I'm saved. I want to attain unto this power of the resurrection, verse 10, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So you've got to say, I want to be conformed to Jesus Christ. Every day, you've got to die daily and put your flesh down. So look at verse 11. He says, I have not attained something. That's what he does. He, if by any means I might attain. So he did not attain something here. But did Paul ever attain something? Yes, look at verse 16. Nevertheless, we're two, we have already attained. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. So Paul did attain. In the same verses, one place he says, I have not attained something. And yet over here he says he has attained. He knows he's saved. But he knows he hasn't attained that walk with God that he wants. And neither of you. 
Neither have I. Amen? And you should thirst for that. I'll give you another word he uses here. Look at perf be perfect now, verse 12. Did Paul say he was perfect? No. He said, not as though I had already attained. That means he didn't attain some things. Either were already perfect. That means in his flesh he's not perfect. And as long as you're in the flesh, you're not perfect. You're not going to attain sinless perfection. Amen. You'll never get there. Paul says, I, I am not perfect. But yet he does say, look in verse 15. Let us therefore as many as be what? Did Paul say he was perfect just now? He did. He said, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. There's your standing and there's your state. He's perfect yet not perfect. He's attained, yet not attained. I'll give you another one. Look at apprehended in verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Did Paul apprehend everything? No. But was there something about apprehension that's perfect? Yes. Look at the same, look at verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended. Jesus Christ apprehended Paul. He was apprehended. He hadn't apprehended perfection. He hadn't apprehended everything he needs to know. Neither has anybody on this, in this world who's a Christian. You're always going to have to keep growing in your state with the Lord. But your standing is perfect. You've attained salvation. And you have been apprehended by Jesus Christ. So for somebody to take verse 11 and try to say, you don't know for sure if you're going to be in the resurrection. You need to keep striving to attain that. That's a lie. He doesn't understand the difference between standing and state. And it's all right there. You read this passage, you're going to see there's Paul's spiritual life in Christ is perfect. And then there's his walk with the Lord that's not perfect. And you have to work on your fellowship. And so then we'll just close on one more thing like that. I'll give you one more verse. It's uh, Look at 1 Corinthians 5.7. So these things show up all through Paul's writings where he's talking about, and this can confuse a Christian, where you see something where somebody hasn't attained it, and yet they have. There's also the idea of an inheritance. You have not attained that. You may lose an inheritance. You may lose some things. And so Paul's always saying you need to strive to obtain and grasp some things, get a hold of some things, lay hold on eternal life. Um, so 1 Corinthians 5, 7 contradicts itself if you don't understand standing in state. Let's read it. Purge out therefore the old leaven. Okay, what's Paul saying in that thought right there? Can somebody, just give me your thoughts. What does that mean? Purge out therefore the old leaven. Yeah, get rid of sin in your life, right? You're, you're a new creature. You know, you got some old habits. Maybe let's just use cigarette smoking because we all, none of us smoke here, right? So we'll just, we'll, that'd be a good one. All right, <laughs> I hope no one does. But you say, well, you know what, that's just, I just feel like that, I shouldn't do that anymore, Lord. And the Lord says, yeah, purge out that old leaven. And then read on a little further, though. But he says, purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, even as, as uh, may be a new lump, as ye are, what? Unleavened. What did Paul just say you're unleavened for? If you've got to purge out the old leaven, then how can you be unleavened? You're both. In your spirit and in your soul, you're saved. You are, you're, you have no sin. That, you, that's what we just read back in 1 John 3, 9. If, if uh, uh, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. You're unleavened. Yet at the same time, you still have that flesh. You still got to deal with it. You still has it crop up. And you still got to cast out and purge out the old leaven, the old sin that comes in your life. And if you have sin, what does it say? Confess. If we, he, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there are some uh, things there on let Christ be formed in you. He's in you, but you need to say, Lord, I want you to grow in me. I want you to help me to grow and develop the life of a true born-again Christian that others can look at and say, that's a Christian. I see Jesus Christ in that person's life. Not just words that I know I'm saved, but the life of Christ. Amen. Let's stop there and take uh, 
some prayer requests now.